Uh, cool, let's get started. So uh, thank you for joining the meetup today uh, in person and online. And we have like a big audience today. So today's topic will be how to build a multi-cloud database as a service. And we'll use TiDB as an example. So uh, today's presenter will be Yunqing Zhou. And Yunqing is a tech lead at PinCat, and he's uh, uh, in charge of the TiDB cloud platform team. OK, mm -hmm. so without further ado, I will hand over to Yunqing, and it's your stage now. OK. Hi, everyone. Today's topic, uh, so I'll be uh, presenting today. And today's topic is about how to build a multi-cloud database and the service. And before actually presenting this topic, I'll present the first demo. And uh, so it is uh, OSS Insight. And uh, this is a very cool site, and I recommend everyone to use it. Uh, so uh, Li Xuan, mm -hmm. so what is your favorite uh, open source project? Um, Kafka. Okay, then Kafka. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, really cool. Apache Kafka. Oh, you can quickly see lots of statistics from Apache Kafka. And uh, on the top corner, you can see that the top event is actually increasing. This is actually reflecting, reflecting the real time uh, data. And uh, so that's one point, one question. Uh, so uh, which country contributes uh, the most to Kafka, or which country has most of the attention to Kafka? I think it's probably the United States. I know it's more in the US. It's open source by LinkedIn. OK, yeah. then let's see. Oh, it's very interesting. It seems like the stargazers are mostly located in China. OK, cool. You know, 30, uh, 38%, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's and uh, if we check the pull request creator, it seems like US is definitely the most contributor, which is 31%. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, and we have all kinds of uh, uh, things like uh, Alibaba contributes the most, and uh, commit history. Oh, that's a lot of info. A lot of info. Mm. Okay. So, uh, since you are also an engineer, yes. so uh, I want to ask that. Uh, how would you build a, a website like this? Yeah, typically, I think for building websites, uh, creating those real-time analytics, we typically use some uh, event path like Kafka to collect all the events that happened in the website, and then uh, using something maybe uh, like an ETL to load the data to a data warehouse and then compute those results, and then uh, loading the data the read up back to a relational database or so NoSQL for actually serving the website. Okay, okay, okay. I can I can already feel the pain since then you have to build a streaming processing pipeline to pump the data, the processing the data, inserting the data warehouse, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, in common cases, and the data warehouse is not good for serving real time traffic. Right, yeah, that's true. But and and how long do you think that you need to build this uh, this uh, this site? Yeah, I, I used to uh, actually build something similar to this in my previous companies. And typically, it takes a um, couple of weeks or even a uh, couple of months, depending on the complexity. And I think the painful part is really like making sure the data in different systems are, are the same, right? Or are matching what you want to be. So that definitely takes a lot of time. Uh, it's not easy. And I would say that a lot of work. Um, is actually building the ETL and making sure the ETL is performing correctly. Then this website, the basic functionality was actually built over a weekend. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah, oh, and uh, we, need, we still need to do a lot of UI stuff, JavaScript uh, uh, okay. stuff, but actual magic is here. Okay. See, this is a real SQL. You know, we are just selecting from this mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For billion events, we just uh, use TiDB to store them all and uh, use uh, and uh, use TiDB to store them directly. Yeah. What the volume of the events? Yeah. You can see on the on the on the top right on the top right corner. It's, right it's four billion. Oh, four billion. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it's four billion, and you can see that it's just uh, we can compute the results very quickly. Okay. How, how, yeah. Sure. That's interesting because uh, typically people don't expect those few queries to finish um, in a short amount of time, right? That's why we build those complicated, uh, yeah. complex uh, 
But we are distributed. So, so a lot of so multiple machines are processing your request, and that's why it is uh, uh, fast. Okay. And also, we have both uh, row-based engines, the columnar engines will further accelerate your 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 uh, queries. Okay. So you can see you can check the other um, uh, chart. You can see okay, it's also all kinds of C code, also from GitHub emails directly. Yeah, I see there are like uh, joins and group one, right? Yeah, this is very complicated and yeah. the URL is gonna cost less than tens of seconds in the in, in, in normal databases. Right. right. That, that's typically take a lot of resources um, if you put sure. it on scale, right? And sometimes um, it's not even be able to return within like a short period of time, right? Yeah. So that's why the uh, tidy is really shy. Oh cool. Yeah. Okay. And that's also amazing. this one. Is this website is actually built on top of TidyB Cloud. Oh, cool. What is okay. TidyB Cloud? Oh, okay, is Tidy then Cloud? let's turn to the real presentation. <laughs> <laughs> TidyB Cloud. Okay, cool. Okay. Oh, I think I'll switch to the actual presentation. One second. Uh, okay. So use TidyB Cloud as an example. So to, I was present how to build a multi cloud database and the service. So first about myself, I'm currently a TL on TV Cloud. And before joining Pincast, I work for Google Cloud and just uh, nearby. And uh, work for Cloud Data Flow team. And uh, someone mentioned Apache Beam, also the part of that team. And the Cloud Data Flow control plane. I'm actually working on the control plane, not the real data processing. So still something similar about how to make, how to deploy clusters, how to make clusters run, or something like that. So today's agenda. So uh, let's first turn to the first topic, which is TIDB Cloud Architecture Introduction. Okay, this is TIDB Cloud. I will give you a full practice demo a little bit later. But now you just need to know that it is the fully managed TIDB clusters on AWS and GCP. So you can just uh, use the buttons to create uh, clusters on that and just use it without managing the infrastructure by all. Uh, I think that uh, you probably already have some basic uh, understanding of how TIDB works. So let's, re let's do a, a quick recap. For TIDB, we have the SQL layer, which is stateless. And we also have the key value storage layer, basically the row based uh, storage for OLTP workloads. And the data is sharded and replicated around, uh, across the nodes. And uh, the data will also be replicated to the column-based storage for OLTP workload, or for OLAP workload, which is called TyFlash. And we also have a, a placement driver here to uh, balance the, um, uh, the, 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 the data shards and the control application. Okay. So some observation here. So first, we have multiple kinds of nodes. Here you can see four. Uh, actually, there are, there are more, like uh, bank of workers, like high CDC, or whatever. And uh, many of them are stateful. Uh, so like that, uh, uh, so like high TV, they real, store real data. So we, you cannot just uh, kill a high DB and replace it with a new node. It's not, 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 not that easy. And uh, deploy the multiple availability zone because we, uh, we are distributed and we are highly high available. Okay, this is very complicated as you see that if you have a bunch of machines, it will take you some time to deploy it by all. Okay. Then we know that the TIDB Cloud Design Keyword. Fully managed, multi-cloud, secure, and high, high availability. How, how to do it? But here is the virtual architecture of TIDB Cloud. Let's start with the deployment part. First, we already know that we need to deploy, uh, we need to deploy uh, the clusters in multiple AZs. Right. We have in, in each availability zone, we have TIDB, TIDKV, PD, and uh, the TIDB Flash. And uh, the deployment system should be uh, cloud agnostic. And uh, then in this deployment system, we will have a cluster controller 
to control the, the balance. And uh, then the customer application will connect us through uh, the, low, the load balancer, which is quite normal, right? This is uh, worth our tech. Okay, so how can we do multi-tenancy? Then one level up. Then we need to provide a per cloud provider region tenant resource container to do the isolation. So for each tenant in each region, in each cloud provider, it will have a container like that. And all resources will be deployed in this uh, container. And uh, then, the, then we already have the control plane to control the deployment and the scaling of whatever. And uh, a lot of time, and we need to send commands to the TIDB, and we need to send command to cloud controller. Then we have the control plane here. And uh, then the control plane, then you have to talk to the control plane for serving the, the user. Okay, so one level of support your system. Okay. Then naturally, you need observability. So we have the monitoring subsystem, and we have all kinds of telemetry. We have the device platform. We have the, the conflict management on our side. We have to do the billing by, by our own. So this is the whole world for architecture of TIDB Cloud. Okay, then let's turn to, to, to something real. How can we do it? This is a real architecture. So for cloud agnostic deployment system, naturally we chose Kubernetes to do to the job. Kubernetes works in GCP, in AWS, work on premise, which is good. And in Kubernetes, we use uh, we uh, developed an open source project called TiDB Operator, uh, which control which manage the TiDB clusters as uh, Kubernetes resources. Then you can just uh, speed up a Kubernetes cluster and install TiDB operators. Then you can use the, the, the KubeCTL to start a TiDB cluster, which is really cool. And uh, on top of that, we use a uh, cloud provider VPC to do the, do the isolation part. And uh, then how can the customer access us? We have two ways. We provide two ways. So first one is VPC peering. Basically, we are, connect, we are just connecting two PCs. And the uh, second is private link. Basically, we provide an endpoint for customer to connect us. And uh, on this part, for conflict management, I will introduce in, uh, uh, one thing called GitOps later. In GitOps, then to our, uh, on our side, the SRE can just uh, change the conflict and push to uh, all clusters without uh, touching the user clusters. Uh, everything is auto auto automatic. Okay, and as I mentioned, the first layer is TIDB operator. Basically, it's abstraction layer across cloud. So first, we already chose Kubernetes as a common abstraction layer for deployment. Then, built on top of a Kubernetes customer resource API, Kubernetes clusters are managed as regular resources in Kubernetes clusters, which is really nice. And uh, so with Kubernetes cluster, uh, with a uh, uh, TIDB operator, okay, we, we can already deploy the clusters in TIDB in Kubernetes. Then we need to control the resource life cycle. For example, how can we know that, uh, how can we uh, start a cluster, the configure load balancer, and the establish the private link appearing? Uh, how can we delete the cluster? It will contain multiple steps. So there naturally, there should be a state machine. So how would you like to, to implement a state machine usually? To implement a state machine, a lot of times you have to find a durable storage to store the cluster state. So every time you do a state change, you are changing the state. But now you have to maintain a highly available data storage system, like probably TIDB, or probably my, my, my SQL with uh, master slave. But here, because we are already using Kubernetes, we are just uh, implementing our state machines on top of Kubernetes customer resources. So all states are saved in Kubernetes. And the highly availability of state storage is provided by GKE or EKS directly, and we are, it's operated at no extra cost, which is really convenient. And uh, actually, TIDB operators also do the same thing. And uh, this is on the right, that's uh, the Kubernetes uh, operator pattern. 
Basically, you are just uh, trying to create a custom resource definitions in uh, in the Kubernetes. And every time you create a custom resource and you have your own controller and uh, to uh, uh, try to listen to the changes and complete changes and commit, and uh, all the state will be saved in Kubernetes itself. It is very, very convenient. You don't need to uh, maintain a separate durable storage. Okay. Uh, okay. Then the next part is that we still need to have the media storage for the control plane, like then the project cluster mapping, like uh, uh, user relations. Previously, we use maintenance for the maintenance for one tenant, which provides very good isolation. Very, very, very natural, and each tenant has its own database, very, very convenient, right? But later we found it's really painful to manage the schemas because then you have tens of schemas or hundreds of schemas to manage. And sometimes you want to do a query to, to across multiple uh, tenants. Like that, uh, you'd like to know, you'd like to list all the clusters across the fleet. And this uh, architecture makes this, uh, the thing really, really painful. So for V2, we just have a one database for. Because we found that okay, performance is okay. One tenant database, and naturally we can just uh, use multiple database instances to store multiple uh, tenants. But now we found that TDB clusters are relatively large. The customer won't have tens of thousands or thousands of thousands of clusters. So there should not be many. Then we just uh, condense them into all into a single database. So skill management made easy. So that's what we are currently using. Here turns to the monitoring subsystem. So uh, this uh, picture is a little bit uh, complicated, but it's not that complicated. So customers have the access to the UI charts and the metrics, and then things go to control plane. We also have a Grafana here and the Elasticsearch for debugging purpose for our, for our no, SREs. And uh, so long-term storage of metrics are stored in Sano. And the control plane will uh, use, use, use this endpoint to penetrate into the VPC and relay the TIDB dashboard. Some, some of you may have some knowledge about how TIDB, uh, what is TIDB dashboard. It is a, a management portal for on-premises uh, uh, TIDB deployments. Here we are doing the relay. And here we have a promise deployment for metrics Okay, this is uh, the current uh, uh, subsystem. Uh, no need to, uh, to remember that. I just want to mention one thing here, very, very, very interesting. So for Prometheus, this is our uh, uh, metric storage system. Previously, we just thought that, okay, use TDB operator to deploy one thing. So, so, so if you are deploying TDB cluster in, uh, in one data, data, data center, you just want to speed up a uh, Kubernetes cluster and use operators to speed up everything, including the TIDB itself and the monitoring uh, instances. So it is very, very quite natural for you to speed up a TIDB resources and TIDB cluster together with a, a Prometheus instance, right? This is a very good because it's a legacy from on-premise deployment and the feeders can be isolated. But the interesting part is that the Prometheus cluster, it is actually not built to the end user because it's not part of the user resources. It's a part of our resources. Then you are actually causing a lot of fragmentation of resources. You are wasting a lot of money, right? And because you don't want to waste money, then you won't uh, allocate a lot of resources for it. But as you know, then the Prometheus will consume a lot of resources depending on the queries. So all of may have it's really hard to manage. So we are currently in the progress of uh, shifting to the next uh, you know, architecture, moving the Prometheus to the outside. And uh, not a, um, probably not a single one, but it's a few bigger ones. It's easier to manage the fleet of small ones, which is quite natural. 
Okay, this is very, very interesting. And uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the best things in this system, which is called GitOps. So sometimes you really, really want to push some config to across multiple instances. Like you want to modify, uh, you, first of all, you want to modify one type Kiwi parameter for version 1.5, for example. And uh, so how can we do it? You can log into the customer clusters and change them by, by, by hand. You can use PSSH to SS to all of the machines to do it. But there's no history, right? There's no approval process. How, how can we do it better? So here, we just use a uh, Git. So you, uh, when you want to change uh, uh, some requests, some, uh, some um, config, just file a pull request into a Git repository. And the Git report as a as there's GitHub action will actually pick up the changes and actually push all the way to the cluster. This is what. And uh, what makes it even better is that when doing the GitHub action, the GitHub action can, can also try to pull the config, the current config from the config story, and provide you a live diff. So before merging your PR, you already know that what the, what, what the gonna change. And all the, all the uh, change history got condensed in the GitHub commit history for all this, which is really, really nice. Yeah, I really, I, I really like it. No need to touch custom classes. For security. Security is very, it's paramount uh, in cloud. And because then you are actually putting your, uh, putting, uh, your resources away from uh, your own data, data center into shared resources, even for cloud providers, that's also shared, right? So how can you provide the security? First, for different customers, different cu clusters from different customers are actually isolated by VPC networks. In the same, uh, in the same VPC, and uh, we also use TLS and use MTL, use mutual TLS across the nodes. So basically, all the nodes are issued a certificate, and they know exactly the who's calling me and who can call me, uh, which have a really, really good security. And uh, TLS also provides the in in encryption. So even if someone has access to the network, it still won't cause much damage. Uh, can you can use our It's also managed by TiDB uh, rule-based uh, access control. So basically, our control plane sometimes need uh, need a very 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 powerful access to the to TiDB because, for example, set some setting some configs, uh, reset your uh, your root password. Here, we are actually using a user, which is uh, using the and it's not backdoor. It is formally granted as the administrator on the TiDB rule-based access control. So we are not that special. Okay. Next topic is the type CDC. So what is CDC? CDC is change data capture. So it is a tool for replicating a synchronized incremental data, incremental, in real time. So uh, you can use type CDC to replicate the data to a different region, or you can use type CDC to replicate the, your, your changes to a Kafka. Yeah, and uh, I think that we already have another, we have already have a previous uh, meetup on type CDC architecture. So here we don't want to explore. So here I'll tell you how can we do type CDC on type CDC cloud. Uh, and the C here are there, okay, this is a, a problem with the chart. This is actually region two. Okay, so uh, we have two regions, and each region has its own PC. And first of all, we need the UVC pyramid to connect these two PCs. Then the two clusters can communicate. And we have two clusters here. So how can we do Thai CDC? So the first option is that we just deploy the Thai CDC here. TIDC will connect to type TV and PD and push data to the downstream like Kafka, TIDB, MySQL. Or we can deploy TIDC here and pull data from the upstream cluster and dump it to the downstream TIDB. 
And uh, in this setup, we are actually doing things, doing more things. Like that, uh, if uh, we are we are scaling up, we are scaling out the upstream cluster. The downstream cluster will in, will be in sync with the last we will be with the upstream cluster. This will make sure that the downstream cluster will not be overwhelmed by the uh, other upstream, which is really nice. Okay. Next topic: How to connect to TypeDB Cloud? So. The first option is VPC peering. It is uh, fairly easy to, to understand. Just merge two networks. And so the two networks become one. This is flat. Very, very easy to understand. Just uh, join two networks. But uh, the problem is that you have to uh, configure the subnet. As you have to, it is your responsibility to make sure that uh, there's no conflict in the IP render. And that's one thing. The other problem is that the internal components on both sides are exposed to each other. Like that, uh, you can see the red ones. On pink on side, if we are malicious, we can spin up a program to uh, do a post scanning on the customer side, on the customer app. And uh, we can also, on the customer, can also do some, uh, some other things like post scanning our applications. This is also, also possible. As we are, as I already mentioned before, you know, we provide a, a good security like a pro, the user MTLS to make sure that no uh, no customer applications access us without our, our, our permission because they don't have the right certificate. But it's still a risk. So this is a new one uh, called Private Link. It's not as new. I think this feature has been around for several years. And the equivalent things on TCP, that's private service connect. It, uh, so the, the online uh, idea is that on the income side, we, pro, we, tr we try to expose TIDB as an endpoint. We call it private link. Then customer will connect to this endpoint. And uh, so the two networks, I see two networks. And uh, we don't need to make sure we we we, we know uh, it is not needed. It's not, not not necessary to make sure that uh, these two networks you no know, no IP conflict. IP conflict is fine. So the pro is that no complex network planning and it is secure. And the downside is that if you need to connect multiple components and like that you would like to use CDC to uh, uh, pump the changes back to the Kafka cluster, they will find that okay. To connect to Kafka, you need to first talk to the master uh, to get all the broker addresses. Then you need to talk to broker. But now you found out, okay, how can you connect to Kafka VPC? Because at Kafka VPC, there's no endpoint here. Okay, this is very, very awkward. Uh, there's no best practice here. I actually uh, read some articles uh, online, and some providers they try to instruct customers to create endpoints to expose their uh, clusters to, to on the customer side create some uh, endpoint here. But it is really really awkward because that you have uh, multiple machines and you need to need to be exposed. You probably need multiple endpoints, which is uh, very very nasty. So currently we don't have a good solution. So currently we we are we are currently saying this. So if you are only need to if you only need to have access to KDB Cloud, I mean KDB, uh, private link is your is a choice. If you are doing complicated things like replicate back to, to Kafka, uh, we need to we need to, to discuss. Okay, back to this. Why you should choose KDB Cloud? As I mentioned, you need to do this, 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 all, all, all by yourself, all, all, all by yourself. Do you really want to do that? A lot of nasty stuff, a lot of complicated stuff. No need. That's to tidy cloud. TIDB cloud will offer from auto disaster recovery features um, to fast TIDB support and no need to pass screenshots around and we may even through our monitor and notice problem before you. And uh, we also have all kinds of, comp of compliance 
And for compliance in a lot of things, you don't need to do by yourself, which is a lot of work. And also, on TIDB Cloud, yeah, as, as, as you see, a lot of uh, responsibility shifted from uh, yourself to Pinkcast. And even for alert handling, it is both. And uh, so for instance, management also both. All, all we need to do is uh, you create cluster. And uh, cluster operation, and uh, so it should be also be customer, but, uh, but via the cloud console, which is a lot easier than your say you deploy things on your own cloud or, or, or your own machine. All right. So this is the first uh, section. Let's move on to the next one. So basically, the lesson learned in building a multi cloud managed DB service. So the first one is that cloud managed services can save your life, really save your life. So TIDB Cloud uh, currently using Gardener Cloud for, uh, so Gardener dot cloud, it is not a real managed cloud service for Kubernetes and service. Gardener is actually a virtual uh, the, uh, Kubernetes um, software. Basically, you can, uh, you can treat it as open source version of EKS or GKE. But, uh, so we chose them years before, but now we saw that it's not for tiny clusters because that uh, TiDB clusters are not that many nodes. And uh, so we have a considerable per cluster over overhead. And uh, also, Gardner try to, uh, it have really opinionated networking, really, really difficult to adapt to our use cases. For example, Gardner have all kinds of VPN system, try to connect all the subcomponents to, to a single one. And this is really, really difficult to, to customize. Single large, it's a really single large system. You cannot take part of it and customize. And the last one is that we found that, okay, we are actually using this system, not uh, changing it. And uh, because we are operating by ourselves, and uh, so upgrading to the next version, next major version, we need to understand it more but we really, really don't have that luxury to understand it much because it is a much bigger system than our system. So we are picking, so, so, so imagine that a, we are kind of a cat sitting on top of a horse and then the, the horse becomes sick. You have, we really have no idea what's going on. So here is on the right side the garden architecture and you have a garden API server and for each region, they have their own control plane and uh, each cannot play manage multiple uh, virtual managed clusters. This is not important because we finally want to uh, want to change to the um, oh uh, no, no need to, to take pictures. Just a search for just search for uh, TIDB and the Gardener. Then you will find that, uh, that uh, we have blog post for, on, on that years before. Now. On the right, you can see that all we need is just the Kubernetes cluster. Whether it's virtual or real, it does not really matter. All we need is someone manages for us because it is not our main business to manage a TIDB cluster, uh, manage a Kubernetes cluster. We need to provide a TIDB cluster, not a Kubernetes cluster. So we just manage the services. And now with CKE and the EKS, they are more focused and they're smaller building blocks and uh, it's easier to customize because it's small. Okay. Next one. Cloud has own category of limits. Really, really naturally, when we first built cloud, we try to put all resources in a single AWS account GC project, which is quite natural. You have a territory, you just want to put all resources in, uh, in a single thing. Until we see this interesting limit. Okay, what's this? Okay, even get uh, this crap actions per account per region that's 20 QPS? And is this getting any better? Okay, a read per project. Apply a, a query. Read per project. 25 requests per second. This is quite low. Can you imagine that the, uh, for a project you want to, to store all your resources? They have an upper city of 25 requests per second and it cannot be increased. 
which is crazy. Then we realize that, okay, so the cloud providers already chose the project ID or account ID and their way to sharding resources, and we, we need to respect the, the, the current effect. And then we need to use multiple uh, account or multiple projects to store our resources. So this is a pain thing to learn, but uh, it's good and never learned. And the cloud could also be very, very expensive. It is quite nice. On the, on the left side, you can see it's quite natural for us to pull all metrics and logs to a single place, which is natural. You'll, you 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 speed up an elastic search cluster, you see that, okay, this is our log. Just pull all of us to a single place. So we saw, okay, this is on the left, that's TCP, uh, TCP networking press sheet. Uh, this is too small, I would, I would say that the first one, it's the same region, different uh, same region, different zone, traffic cost. That's one cent per gigabyte. And here, between regions, and uh, in Europe, oh, that's two cents. In Asia, five cents. Oh, which means that in Asia, same zone traffic is actually one sixth of the cross uh, cross region traffic. Oh, okay, so we realize that okay, we need to really need to change that picture to, to this because the law of the metrics are a story in a single place just for convenience reasons, and for convenience reasons, you really, really don't want to don't, don't need to to pay, to pay that much. Just to have something in my region. Yeah. Also, building is not easy. And uh, and uh, database and the service uh, system, we need to do billing. And uh, there are things that uh, we previously get from uh, AWS or TCP, and the case the amount of resources they use and rebuild to customers. And because that, uh, uh, we use share, so a lot of a lot of tenants share the same uh, AWS account, so we use the labels to, to to distinguish them. And then. We use labels to get the uh, tenant share and the uh, pass the customer until we found that, okay, oh, just pass it directly to the customer. It's okay, but together with how to deal with the leaked resources. Do you, do you really want to build leaked resources to customers? Do you really want to uh, make sure that uh, they want to to leak the labeling errors for the customers, you are bill A with B, or uh, there are unchecked resources. Do you want to, uh, if, you, if you forgot to label, do you want to pass it to the customer? And if you are doing this architecture, you are actually uh, changing your P2 bugs into P0 production issues, which is not ideal. So make sure, make sure that you are building something that you can see, as customers can see, not something that directly appear on your AWS. Uh, another thing about cost. On cloud, cost analysis is a, is a must because the cloud is more than VM and object storage. I, I, I think you can, on the left you can see we use all kinds of resources. This is just part of the chart and then we have a lot of things on the, underneath. So it is very crucial for you to establish your own data pipeline to collect all the data, all the, all the usage, and all the bills, and all the costs into a data warehouse and do the analysis efficiently. On the right, you can see that we have, this is a part of the screenshot from our chart, and this is the pertinent usage. And we have lots of them. You have to know yourself much more. Okay, uh, a short slide about the future, future uh, about the uh, future. For future, uh, we definitely need to lower the control plane over, overhead. Now the per uh, cluster overhead is still not ideal. And uh, you also need to explore shared architectures as you, as you know that the things like shared or serverless, they are, all re they are really, really hot words and we want to explore that. And also, we are already on the cloud. 
we really want to use cloud much more, much more than deploying TiDB or bring TiDB from on-premises to cloud. Like I say, in, on the cloud, we can say that uh, if we can use EBS snapshot to do the backup efficiently rather than just uh, uh, dumping it, dumping it at files. And uh, we will have more upstream and downstream integrations with AWS and GDP technically. Okay, so I'll do a demo. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask now. And I will answer while I set, up, I set up the demo. Or I can just start the cluster first. So, uh, one second. Okay, this is a TiDB Cloud UI. So when you log in, you can see it is a TiDB Cloud. And there's no, uh, no actual cluster. Let's create one. And when you create a cluster, you can create a developer tier, which is free, free, free. <laughs> and uh, on the right, that's dedicated here. That's a uh, pay by usage. And uh, today, for demo purpose, we just need a one year free trial and uh, half gigabyte of uh, storage. Okay, that's good. Class zero provider, and uh, we'd like it to be in Oregon. And great. And uh, okay. Let's check the thing that we want to do. Apply. Okay. It is being created. Then I will show you how the demo will be like. Uh, okay. The demo is like this. We will have a program uh, feed data into TiDB Cloud. And uh, we will have a, also have a web app read from a TiDB uh, so the feeder will feed the live GitHub PR feed, but now it's fake data, and uh, into TiDB Cloud. And uh, so then the web app will pull from TiDB Cloud, uh, try to group by user and count them for the last time period as a leaderboard. So we will see a leaderboard here. Okay, so. This is uh, actual code, and you can see that we are connecting to TiDB using PyMySQL. Basically, a MySQL, uh, uh, some, uh, it's a driver for MySQL, right? On the right, that's the insert part. Basically, no, just no magic. We just create a table and the insert, right? Insert, and uh, that's it. Nothing very special. On the left, that's the app engine uh, app. Basically, as you see, as we just, uh, this is a legal statement. Basically, it's the author, group by author, and the limit. And also, we have a stream. Basically, select uh, something for the last uh, order by insert time, limit 20. And this is HTML. And that's it. OK. So let's see then if uh, the. TiDB cluster is created. Okay, node is already provisioned, and we are actually setting up the TiDB cluster. It will be probably ready in one minute. And uh, I also I see that there are some Q and A here. I can answer them first. Sure. I, I think there's a question about what is the plan and timeline to extend to other regions on AWS, uh, specifically uh, the central one. Okay. So I can answer that. Yeah. So the thing is that. We, uh, so uh, currently, to, to provision node in a new region, we have to set up some control plane part in that new region. And as you know, that uh, setting up something in a new region uh, costs time and uh, costs resources. And uh, if there are no customers on that, and we are wasting resources. But if you'd like to uh, talk to us, we can set up for you. So uh, there's, no, there's nothing called a timeline. It's just a, a power request. So feel free to talk to us. Okay. Yeah, if you want to build something cool, and uh, I think we can help you. Yes. Yeah. So that is not a blocker to onboard into the TiDB cloud. Um, so, uh, okay. So probably need uh, a few more minutes. I can just uh, uh, show you something already uh, alive. Yes. This, is a, this is a live one. 
uh, this is live. I can show you some uh, features. For the live one, you can see that uh, we can see some basic things. And if you click the cluster, you can click. You can have some uh, basic chart here. And you can you can tune the. You can have a node map. It's not an interest because there's not a lot of nodes. If you have more nodes, then obviously this one probably will be more more interesting. And then we have uh, the backup. You can see. Okay, this is auto backup. And you can also do things manually. And uh, diagnosis part I will see later if you will have that. Hmm. Probably in a few more minutes to connect, but it's fine. Diagnosis. And you see, okay, there's no QPS here. Let's let's do something. Okay. So the SQL web shell, uh, we have the web shell here. Okay, I see. Well, this is not my fault. And I'll do it again. Sometimes. Oh, we already have GitHub uh, database because this is already created. Uh, oh, this is created. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, let's use this newly created one. Okay, connect. For that and open the SQL shell. Okay. Okay, then let's uh, create database. Okay. And then let's get, uh, let's configure something here. First of all, we need to make sure that, uh, sorry, the PCP ring is not available for this uh, uh, shared cluster. It is, but uh, if you are using uh, it for production, don't do this. This is for demo purpose, because I will connect it to format MG. Okay, this is actual DNS here. And what I'm gonna do is that I just, uh, Replace the the address here. Okay, then let's turn back to the uh, monitoring. Okay, zero point one, and run feeder. Okay, we are just inserting data into it. And we can also deploy it on Google App Engine. It will take about one minute. And because it's inserting already, you can see the diagnosis. Oh, insert into 33 execution, meaning it is a 2.5 million. If you refresh, Oh, 52. We are actually trying to insert. It costs a lot. And if you click on that, you can see the execution. And uh, if it is slow, it will have, have the slow query statistics, but here it's not slow. And But we have the time breakdown for pass, compile, or whatever. Yeah, some uh, basic information about this. And as you see, and we try to group this by categories. So uh, different values or different parameters won't affect the aggregation. Okay, updating service. I think then the monitoring probably already shows something here. Okay, and you see that the monitoring already shows the, the elevated QPS and the storage size already increased. And let's check. 
Uh, oh, probably one, two, three, four, five seconds. The day is a little bit slow. Okay. And you can see the diagnosis. Okay, here is only insert and not much select. But now we are spin up the demo. The network is auto refresh leaderboard. You can see it's, re it's refreshing. And you can see here. Ah, we have this. Select author, count, count deletions, count deletions. And uh, it is also good. Not much slow, and uh, we have a different kind of distribution here. And uh, back to the QPS, you can see that the QPS is changing. Okay, that's all for today's presentation.